Hi, I'm Meredith Hutchison Hartley. I'm Emily Geddes. I'm Frank Hutchison. And welcome back to the Hidden History of Business podcast, where today we are celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Woohoo! Love Woo! the Irish. Oh, something. that was adorable. Thank you. Super adorable. Today we're going to be covering the real connection between St. Patrick and beer. And no, it's not just that Americans drink a lot of it on St. Patrick's Day. We're also going to explore the origins of the stereotype of the witch with that big nose and the pointy hat and the cauldron. And the history of industrialized beer in Ireland. And how the obsession of the English landlords actually led to the industrialization of beer in Ireland. So let's get started. Well, let's go back 5,000 years, roughly, to agriculture being introduced to Ireland, where you have wheat and barley starting to be grown. And this is the Bronze Age, early Iron Age. You have people getting the grains. They're now making bread. And, of course, bread, as we've talked about before, leads to beer. beer. So this is basically a home industry and women are doing as Time goes on. As we've discussed in our early beer episodes, if you go back and listen to Introduction to Beer or Beer in Mesopotamia, we talk about this in more detail. Yes. Now you have St. Patrick arriving uh, in Ireland, and he drives out all the snakes. Supposedly. And at the same time, he introduces Christianity, which also means that you have monks coming to Ireland, and they set up monasteries. Now, a monastery would have land. They would grow grain, or they would have tenants that would grow grain. And the rent would be paid in grain. And what do you do with grain? You make bread. Oh, if you make bread, you're probably going to have some excess and turn it into beer. And the monks were particularly interested in making beer because, as we've discussed in other episodes, they could drink it during Lent, and it was less likely to go bad in their storehouse. It was a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> There's that, too. So you have the monks brewing beer, but... At the same time, you still have the home production. Yes, and that home production was dominated by women, by housewives. As part of their traditional household responsibilities, going as far back as Mesopotamia, women were brewing ale and beer in conjunction with their other household duties. It also got to the point where they would have a little bit extra. They would try to make a little bit of a profit to supplement the household income. And they would sell some of their home-brewed beer or ale on the side. Uh, it got to the point where they would often have a room set aside in their private home for selling and drinking this ale. Now, we've got the monks who are brewing beer and selling it. We have these women selling their homemade beer and ale. So we've got competition going on here. And, and there were also male brewers in the area as well. Yes. So when you have competition going on, you're always looking for that edge. You're looking for that, that one thing that's going to put you ahead of your competition or the one thing that's going to push your competition down a little. And one of the ways that this was manifest was using the stereotypes of the time. Medieval Europe was a pretty misogynistic time. No. Yes. You're kidding. Now... <laughs> Unfortunately, often tied to Christianity, but of course not exclusively, there were negative traditions about women. Women were seen as naturally unfaithful. They were seen as instinctively wicked and unreliable. They were untrustworthy. And all of this kind of goes back to a you know certain interpretation of the Adam and Eve story. Mm -hmm. That was and, common in medieval times. And Jezebel and Delilah. I mean, oh, these yes. stereotypes of these women who are going to lure men somewhere and lead them into immorality. In general, women were seen as temptresses, as seductresses that drew men into sin of various types. And alewives, women who were homebrewing this, this ale and this beer, were seen in that same light. They were under more suspicion than the men who were doing the same work. There were implications of women being more sexually uncontrolled or duplicitous. Uh, they would tease and they would flirt with their customers to get more business. There were stereotypes that alewives, they were ugly, but they were still sexual beings. There's this great quote from a book by Judith M. Bennett called Ale, Beer, and Brewsters in England, Women's Work in a Changing World. 
and this is great, it says, perhaps most important, like all women, alewives were deemed prone to disobedience. Their work threatened the ideal of a proper patriarchal order. In flirting with customers, alewives undermined the authority of their husbands. In handling money, goods, and debts, they challenged the economic power of men. In bargaining with male customers, they achieved a seemingly unnatural power over men. In avoiding effective regulation of their trade, they insulted the power of male officers and magistrates. And perhaps most important, in simply pursuing their trade, they often worked independently of men. Now, these were seen as very, very threatening things to the overwhelmingly patriarchal order of the time in medieval Europe. So we have this already fertile ground for distrust of women. Plenty of stereotypes that can be exploited against your competition if they are a woman. Yes, and it was actually so effective that some of these stereotypes are still seen today in a way that you wouldn't really tie them together. But this is fascinating. The stereotype that we have of our, our Halloween witch where it, with the the broomstick and the cat and the cauldron and you know the like big the hat. wicked witch and the wizard of oz yes that it's actually can be traced back to this demonization of alewives show your work yes ma'am <laughs> so let's talk about some of those stereotypes some of those clichés that we have cauldrons cauldrons were used in the brewing process whether it was ale or beer you had to have a, a vat a cauldron a pot to do the brewing in so when you see a witch's cauldron that was the pot that they brewed in and mm-hmm. was she adding to it all these herbs, herbs and spices and, and she would have her own proprietary blend to make it taste better yes oh and then and interestingly that also would have undermined the power of the church because the ch- uh, we discuss in our interview with Mark Gall in our episode uh, ridiculous regulations in craft brewing the church actually owned a proprietary blend you were supposed to use for your beer mm. but if the alewives had their own blend they were undermining that revenue source as well yes and then you got to think about advertising now when ale was sold out of private homes ale houses like i mentioned before um you still had to have a way to advertise to let people know that you were selling ale out of your home like all of the the graphic science people hung on the streets right so they would use an ale steak to announce that ale was available for drinking. And this was a bunch of barley stalks tied to a tall stick and put outside the door. And if you flip that upside down, it kind of looks like a broom, a stick with the grains coming off the the bottom. And the string tied around it. Yeah, it does. So how about cats? Well, you make beer and ale out of grain. And where there is some kind of grain storage, you're going to have rodents. And where there are rodents... It is a good idea to have cats oh, maybe, to yeah. kill the rodents so that they don't eat up your grain. So alewives would often keep cats around to protect their grain supply from the rodents and the rats. Wow, that's mm-hmm. a lot. <laughs> and here's my favorite one. The big pointy hats that which is where like pointy with the big brim. Yes, all the that. very very Wicked distinctive e- easy to spot hats. When you see one of those hats, you know it's a witch, right? right? Okay, well, in medieval times, they would have these big markets, these big, like, festivals where people would come together from all these different towns to sell their wares. Well, it can be really difficult in a crowd to spot people, right? Right. Because everybody's, you know, about the same height or whatever. So alewives would often wear large, colorful hats that would stick up above the crowd so people could see where they were and come to them to buy their beer or their ale, and we see that today mm-hmm. with, like, for example, chefs wear a distinctive hat. Mm-hmm. So you'd have a certain type of hat. You go to, like, the, the county fair or anything. You always have the sellers walking through the crowd. And they're, they're, like, they're holding the, uh, you know, the big stick with the cotton candy on it. Yes. So you can find them in the crowd. Yes. Exactly. Well, the same principle applies here. So now we have the big pointy hat, the cat, the broom-looking thing okay. as they're advertising, and the cauldron that are all four very easily identifiable as a stereotypical you know, Halloween style witch. The whole package. Absolutely. Wow. And we also know that they're hags. They're right. Ugly right. hags. That's wild. Isn't it? So uh, we're talking about these two groups. I mean, you have these small local brewers. You have the monastic system, which while it's it's a larger scale, is still relatively local work. The monks weren't buying grain from far away, and they weren't buying it up on a large scale to do their brewing. So when you start reaching about the 1600s, we be- see the very beginnings of industrialized 
brewing coming into the UK and Ireland. Now, that begins with a what we call the grain wars of the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s. Throughout history, grain has shaped wars, it's shaped economies, and in England, frequently they would have a surplus of grain. When all the countries around you are having a famine, that's a great thing because you have people you can sell that grain to. And that's what everyone wanted. They wanted to produce more grain and sell it to people who didn't have grain because it gave them power over their neighbors. And that was why people wanted to have colonies because they would sell them mm -hmm. their goods. But that colonial system created problems because as the English developed the American colonies, they realized that the Americans could undercut English farmers because of the plantation system. In the United States, the, especially in the South, the plantation system allowed them to do a lot, uh, produce a lot of grain using slave labor. So their costs were cheaper and they could sell it at a lower price. But the British had the surplus of grain that they wanted to get rid of. So the British government started subsidizing grain exports. It was specifically, once they realized that it was cheaper to sell liquor and beer than it was to ship grain, they started subsidizing specifically that liquor and beer exportation. And it's also easier to ship. Well, it's, that's you exactly have it. Bottles or barrels, and mm -hmm. it's easier to ship the barrels because you're basically condensing. And it's a smaller volume. You have less spoilage because the liquor doesn't go bad as quickly as grain would. So you're not losing as much product. So this was what they wanted to do. But gradually, these countries around them started having good years too. So they didn't always have that market to sell to, and this created a problem, particularly for the aristocracy and the landlords. Because if local farmers couldn't sell their grain, the people who were farming the land that you had rented to them, they couldn't pay their rents to you in money. You wanted them to sell their grain so they had gold to pay their rent. The alternative is that they would pay you in grain, but if they couldn't sell their grain, how were you supposed to sell that grain? So they started looking for newer ways to use this excess. Some of that turned into creating new forms of liquor. It used to be, prior to about 1700, that most people viewed those hard spirits as a medicinal product. But suddenly, as industrialization is coming in, people are working these long days, these hot, heavy jobs. They're starting to push these strong liquors as a daily refreshing drink instead of as just a medicine that you take, take when you're not feeling well. On top of that, they receive permission for, by changing regulations to start brewing stronger beer. Specifically, they start adding their excess corn to beer to give it a richer flavor, make it stronger. And that's where we start to see that black stout that we talk about in our beer and industrialization episode. They were trying to find ways to use more of this excess grain. And finally, the big hit came in the late 1600s when these landlords banded together with malters, with grain producers, with distillers and brewers to convince the British government to allow them to export beer to Ireland. It caught on like wildfire. By the end of the 1700s, the English were exporting 100,000 barrels of beer to Ireland every year. It was a massive market, and they were pretty sure that they had solved their economic problems. They had a hold on that market. It wasn't going to change. This is really important. They needed this money. Britain was fighting wars on so many fronts, from the French-Indian War in the early 1700s to the Revolutionary Wars to the, the repeated wars with France. They needed this money. In fact, the exportation and the excise taxes that they got from exporting beer and liquor was literally funding the army and navy for most of the 1700s. And right after the War of 1812 ends and those Napoleonic Wars, suddenly they lose it all. By 1820, the market for exported beer in Ireland had completely disappeared because, and Frank, you're going to cover this. Well, you have the rise of Guinness. 1759 mm -hmm. is when it was founded. Now, there were hundreds of breweries in Ireland. But they were mostly small scale. They were folks like the, the monastic brewers. They were using local grain to produce local beer. It was mostly that light beer. Mm -hmm. And they were exporting this darker beer from England because they weren't really sure how to make it themselves. There weren't really industrial scale brewers in Ireland. But Guinness and a couple others started growing at the expense of other breweries. Mostly what they would do is they'd buy them up. One thing that Guinness did that really gave them advantage is they were probably the first brewery 
to improve their transportation and distribution of beer. They used the canals, mm -hmm. which made it was a lot cheaper to ship things by way of canal by water than it was over land. They could reach more people with a lower cost product. That was a winning strategy for them. So not only did Ireland by the early 1800s finally have an industrial scale brewer who could do that great English dark beer that they wanted, but they also had someone who could do it cheaper than even the British subsidies could produce. Yes, and you start seeing Guinness, of course, they captured the Irish market. Uh, they were number one in Ireland, and then shortly thereafter, they become number one in the world because they were just literally outproducing everyone else. And we talk about this in our beer and industrialization episode. Yes. That by mm -hmm. one point in the mid-1800s, at least one in eight men in Dublin was employed or had their employment dependent on Guinness's operations. Yes, very efficient. Of course, Guinness today has breweries all over the world, although all the Guinness beer in America comes from Ireland. It does. So you do That's have why that. why it's so expensive. Yes. But you get to the 20th century, you have the industrialization is complete. They are just proving the efficiencies. Then Guinness is basically the beer now you get to the recessions that occurred back in the 90s, 1990s, where you start having the resurgence of home brewing. In fact, the first ones, first wave sort of came in the 1980s, early 1980s. So you have this return sort of where they started at. Which we see mirrored, if you go back again and listen to that episode on ridiculous regulations and craft beer, we talk about that happening here in the United States, too. You start getting small breweries doing craft beers, you get home brewers. And that was, so you're saying this wasn't just in the U.S.? No, it's not. In fact, part of it is a reaction to the globalization of beer. If you only have one producer of beers, in a sense, which you had with Guinness, you know, they produce a few types. But you don't want your beer, like your beer to be one of those. You want something a little bit different. It creates a market. For others to come in, may not be a large market, but it's a market. Well, just like with the alewives, they were producing their own little proprietary blends, and you'd have a bunch of those in a local area. Mm -hmm. We're going back to that. And you'd have the locals who'd go to their alehouse for their pint, and you still see that today. Well, so on St. Patrick's Day this year and every year, when you go to get whatever your particular poison is, be it a craft beer or a homebrew or a pint of Guinness or whatever fits your fancy, take a minute and think about this awesome history and diversity of beer in Ireland and, well, maybe also those horrible stereotypes about women. Just just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Think of your server as a witch, you know. And tip her well. <laughs> tip her so well. Oh, sweet heavens. Tip them well. Oh, yeah, that. If you like this episode, consider leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or social media. You can find snark, updates, and behind-the-scenes peeks of production on Twitter. Our handle is at HiddenBiz. That's at Hidden B-I-Z. You can also find us on Facebook as The Hidden History of Business. Music for this podcast is from the album Time Within Itself by Michael Waldrop and used with permission of the artist. You can find out more about it on iTunes and Amazon. If you'd like to access show notes and multimedia content and the periodic rant from your hosts, be sure to visit our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com. 